Now, what did he tell them was going to happen? Number one, uh, this is what Jesus said. He gives three essential points. Look at verse 15 of chapter 24. First, the trouble leading up to Christ's coming kingdom rule will start with one man's actions in Jerusalem's holy place. Look what verse 15 says. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Now, that's a complicated verse. Jesus is citing an Old Testament passage from Daniel. And Jesus said a person, he calls them the abomination that causes desolation, and he says they're going to stand in a place. Well, what's the, let's just take, unpack this. What is the, when it says they're standing in the holy place? Well, that word is used, I mean, that expression, holy place, is used 54 times in the Old Testament. 100% of the time, it's the temple or before the temple, the tabernacle. So all 54 in the Old Testament, it's the tabernacle or the temple. In the New Testament, it's used five times, primarily in Hebrews, every time referring to the, the holy place of the temple, like Herod's temple, Solomon's temple, using of the place where the Ark of the Covenant, where the menorah, where the bread, uh, the showbread, in the altar of incense, and the brazen, all those things, that was called the holy place. Now, now look what he says. When you see this person, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of by Daniel, standing in the holy place, the temple, it's in Jerusalem. Now, that's led to a lot of people saying, wow, this, this has already happened. That, that, you know, that's Antiochus, or that's the Romans when they came and because there's no temple there today. Yeah, but God said there's a temple there in the tribulation. It's in Revelation 11. John says there's a temple. He, he sees it. He talks about it. Paul says there's a temple. Paul says the very same thing. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians that the Antichrist is going to be in the temple. What temple? The temple that's in Jerusalem. So basically, Jesus says the trouble that's going to cause his coming kingdom rule is when a certain person, this abomination that, that Daniel talked about. Now, real quickly, just keep your place there and turn back to Daniel chapter 9. Remember, we were in 8 last, or 7 last time. Skip forward to chapter 9. I just want to do two verses in there. Chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. And we'll do a simple explanatory Bible study. We'll read through it and talk about what it means. It says, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. What 62 weeks? Well, it's the time between the, the rebuilding of Jerusalem and Jesus being crucified. It, it actually starts back in verse 25, and it says that, that people are going to come back and they're going to rebuild Jerusalem. They're going to put up the wall. They're going to put the streets down. And after seven weeks and 62 weeks, seven is in chapter uh, nine, verse 25. After those 69 weeks, Jesus is going to be crucified. How long is 69 weeks? Well, it's about 483 days if the weeks are days. Between Nehemiah's time and Christ's crucifixion is not 483 days. So we know these aren't literal seven-day weeks. Now, in chapter 10, in verse 2, whenever it has the number, like three full weeks, those are literal seven-day weeks. But this word is actually heptad. It's actually sevens. So there's going to be 69 sevens. Well, if you multiply 69 times seven years, you get 483 years, and it happens to be exactly how long it was from Nehemiah until the crucifixion. But what's interesting is, it ends with one week outstanding. Now watch in verse 26. After the 62 and seven weeks, Messiah will be cut off. That's the crucifixion, but not for himself. That's the substitutionary atonement. But look now, here comes something beautiful. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70? Daniel said, somebody's coming. The Roman Empire. We all know that. Titus and the Ninth Legion came and they camped on Mount Scopus and they leveled the place. So look what it says in verse 26. The people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary are going to have a prince who is to come. That's where, if you've ever heard in your mind of the revived Roman Empire, it doesn't come from Hal Lindsey or John Walvert or John Darby. It comes from Jesus Christ and Daniel. And God says that the Roman Empire is going to resurface in the future. The same people that destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70 are coming back. 
Well, actually, they never left. They've just kind of been fragmented. And every piece of the old Roman Empire has had its day in the sun. Every part of the Roman Empire has ruled a vast amount of this earth, the last one being Britain, who ruled a bigger empire than anybody's ever ruled. But those people, the revived Roman Empire, is going to have a leader. He's called the prince in verse 26. Now look at him being talked about in verse 27. Then he... Who is that? The prince who is to come, the revived Roman emperor, who the Bible calls the Antichrist. He, and look at this, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. There's the other week. And how many, is it seven days? No, it's it's in context, it's seven years. One week of years, seven years. That's how we get the seven-year tribulation, right from here. One week, it's seven years. But he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, there's, there's where you get, you've heard of mid-trib this or that, or you've heard of the three and a half years and three and a half years, if you've seen charts. That's what it's from. In the middle of the week, he, who is the he? It's the he of verse 27, he shall confirm. Who's that? It's the prince of verse 26, who is to come, the Roman revived empire leader. He will bring an end to the sacrifice and offering, So that means some in this week of years, this seven-year period, the Jews are allowed to go back to sacrifice and offering. Boy, will that take an amazing thing for the Muslims to let them do that in Jerusalem. But, But this leader is going to bring an end to their sacrifices, and here's Christ's quote, and on the wings of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. So that is exactly what Jesus is talking about. Go back to Matthew 24 and look at verse 15. Therefore, when you see this man in Jerusalem, in the temple, that is causing this problem and stopping the the sacrifice in the temple and breaking his covenant with Israel, then that's when everything is going to start happening. So the first thing Jesus says is the trouble leading up to Christ's coming in verse 15 of chapter 24 happens when the Antichrist is in the temple and he puts up his image and we read that in Revelation. Now look in verse 16, where does all this happen? Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. All this happens in Jerusalem that's in the region of Judea. So all this happens in a literal place with a literal person. Second, Look at what Jesus says in verse 21. His coming kingdom rule will follow a global holocaust. Look what verse 21 says. It says, for then there will be a great tribulation. Now we're finding where that term comes from. Where the seven years comes from, it's from what Jesus said is in Daniel. Where does the term, the tribulation, come from? It's right here. Jesus is the one that introduces us to the great tribulation. You know, and a lot of people say, well, this is all describing um, AD 70. Okay, let's let Jesus tell us if this is describing AD 70. Jesus says, for then there will be a great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor shall ever be. And unless, verse 22, those days were shortened, no flesh would survive. Have a million people ever been killed in a battle like were killed in the siege and destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70? Mm-hmm. Over and over again. Uh, what, 20 million to 50 million in World War II? How many million in World War I? How many million since? I mean, 100,000 already in Syria. I mean, the world did not end in AD 70. It wasn't the worst time. It wasn't close to extinction of humanity. Jesus said this event is a singular event. Notice that Jesus uses extreme apocalyptic superlatives. Look back at 21 and 22. He says it's great. He said it's not nor ever shall be anything like it. And he says no flesh will survive if I don't cut it short. Those are superlatives. Those are apocalyptic terms. What Jesus is talking about here hasn't happened yet. So no man has stood in Jerusalem in the temple yet and made the abomination that Jesus was talking about and no apocalyptic event like the tribulation has happened yet. Third thing Jesus says, look at chapter 25. Turn over to chapter 25 and verse 31. He's still talking about this. In Matthew 25, 31, the third point Jesus makes is his coming rule is going to be seen by every one of us This morning, if you're a believer, you're going to see this event. Number two, by every saint that's ever lived. Number three, by every angel. Look what it says in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory 
and all the holy angels with him. Have you ever thought about how many angels there are? God clears heaven of every angel. That means all the cherubim, all the seraphim, all the normal angels, the archangels, all of them, the seven that always face the throne, all of them, probably billions, are all coming with Christ at the front. Now we see this in, in Revelation 19. It talks about at the front is Christ uh, on a white horse and, and it says King of Kings and Lord of Lords and he's coming and it says arrayed behind him. You know, every time, every time I see the geese coming or going, you know how they always have that one in the front that's breaking the, the way for them so they can all fly in the, the uh, airstream behind him. I always think about that, reminds me of that of Christ breaking the way through and that huge cloud of angels. But Jude adds, Jude, the Lord's brother that wrote the book of Jude, in verse 14 he says, behold the Lord comes with myriadum of myriadum of saints. Myriads we get in English, of myriads. The word myriad was the largest number in the Greco-Roman world. They didn't have a number higher than that. Myriad means an uncountable number and Jude records that Enoch said, the Lord comes with myriads times myriads of saints. Well, that made me think, how many saints could there be? Well, I went to that trusty source, the World Population Bureau of the United Nations, who is always on top of everything, and they, who are promoting zero population growth, have estimated that since humanity emerged 50,000 years ago, they're off by one zero, but it's okay. Uh, but when humanity emerged, when first humans started existence on Earth until today, the United Nations says between 46 billion humans have lived and 110 billion humans up through today. So between 50 and 100 billion. And if even 10% of those, if even 5% of those have believed and repented, not only are those billions of angels coming, but it says all of the saints are coming too. So can you imagine verse 25, when the Son of Man comes with his glory, I mean that's enough, just his glory. Uh, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1 that it's, it's like flaming fire. He's gonna look like this, this uh, you know, asteroid burning up in the atmosphere, just in flaming fire he's coming and, and everybody's scared to death and behind him is the largest assemblage of anything that's ever been coming toward earth and everybody's just fallen apart. And then it says he sits on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them as a shepherd divides his sheep. I mean, this is tracking right with what Isaiah said, right with what Jeremiah said, just what Habakkuk said, just what every major and minor prophet said all the way through the Old Testament, that he's coming to earth and he's gonna sit on a literal throne on earth. And he's gonna gather everybody in front of him. He's gonna divide them up and he's gonna invite the people that survive the tribulation to live on earth for 1,000 years with no carnivorous animals, no poisonous spiders or serpents. Uh, no, it probably weeds will be abated. Wow, you know, I spent too long yesterday weeding in my garden. And all of that will be withdrawn and humanity will finally live in utopia with Christ as king. Christ's coming kingdom rule will be seen by every one of us, every saint that's ever lived, every human alive on earth at the closing moments of the tribulation of course, we know that inescapable judgment comes. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 17, repent, or when I come, you're gonna face the fire. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone who says with their mouth, Lord, Lord, but those who do my will, they go into the kingdom. And Jesus said in Matthew 13 that at that day, at the end of the age, the angels will come and separate and cast the wicked into the place of wailing and gnashing of teeth. But communion is where those two very diverse worlds combine. At communion, we primarily think of Jesus dying and being buried and risen and his blood cleansing us. But Jesus said, don't forget at communion, I'm coming and my kingdom's coming and you should long for that. And I think sometimes we just love what he did on the cross and we don't realize the same one who died on the cross has to come back and right all wrongs. Did you read over the weekend? 
the Nigerians, I forget the name of the Muslim terrorist group in Nigeria, but they surrounded a little boarding school of, of uh, a little mission thing and they took their jerry cans of gas and they, they doused five gallon cans around the dormitories of the boys and girls and then they sat outside and shot them as they, you know, kind of like, you know, starting an anthill on fire and then killing the ants. They were, they were murdering those children. And, you know, we say, why doesn't God do something? He is. He's coming back. He knows who those terrorists are and he knows everyone of the kids in the building too. And they're all going to stand in front of him See, we're just off on the timing. But God is going to bring his kingdom to earth. He is going to right all wrongs. And that's what the Lord told us. That communion reminds us Christ is coming. Christ is coming to set up his Father's kingdom. Christ is going to reign on earth. Christ is our king. And every time we celebrate communion, we're saying that we belong to him. And it's a promise that he's made that he's going to return. Now, one more thing. Look at Matthew 6. This, this is the icing on the cake. Not only does communion connect revelations, all of that prophesied future, all the stuff we've been slugging through, connecting it and saying that at communion we're supposed to remember that all that's going to happen and it's part of God's plan. But you know what it says in Matthew 6? This is the final connection. It says in Matthew 6, starting in verse 10, actually 9, in this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Look at verse 10. Your kingdom come. Do you know what we're supposed to pray? Not just think about at communion once or twice a month. Do you know what we're supposed to pray every day? Do what you promised you're going to do in Revelation. Come like you said you're going to come. Right all wrongs. Come in flaming fire. Take vengeance on the sinners. Reward the righteous. Let us enter into your kingdom. See, at Christ's ministry, he connected all this. He said, don't think a prophecy is detached and out there and it's kind of a non-essential. Every time you celebrate communion, remember, I'm not going to have communion until I get done with what I wrote about in Revelation. And every time you pray, ask me, look at verse 10, your kingdom come. Come and rule on earth, Lord Jesus. That's supposed to be on our hearts every day. So when we read the news, when we see the massacres, when we see all the what's going on in Egypt, what's going on wherever it's going to go on today, we say, thy kingdom come. Do what you told us you're going to do. The amazing blessing Thy kingdom come means that we ask for Christ coming to rule. We don't just ask for it in the future. Part of it is saying, and I want to be doing what you called me to do because I'm your subject. I seek your kingdom in my life today. And that's a connection with communion. So every time we celebrate communion, you're thinking about revelation. Every time you pray, we're thinking about revelation. As we live our days, we're saying, Lord, You know what's happening. I want to be in sync with your plan.